You're listening to the Packernet Podcast Network. Ladies and gentlemen, let me ask you a question. Have you ever heard in your entire life of test driving a phone network? Well, now you have, because U.S. Cellular is going to let you test drive their network for free for 30 days. So anywhere you go where you got some dead spots, where your service isn't super strong, you're trying to listen to the podcast and it drops out when you go here because you got no internet service anymore, real simple. Just whip out your phone, do a little beep boop bop boop, that's you pushing the buttons to go to the right place, and you can get the app and try it out for yourself. So go ahead and test drive U.S. Cellular's award-winning network free for 30 days. That's U.S. Cellular, built for us. Terms apply, awards based on open signal independent data. So go to uscellular.com for all the details. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome once again to the Packernet Podcast. I am your host and resident fanalist, as always, Ryan Schlipp. Check us out online, packernet.com. Find me on Twitter, pack underscore daddy. I am broadcasting live, but sort of recorded in the Vivid Seat Studios. If you're still feeling super jacked up like I am almost 24 hours later, and you're thinking, you know what, I need to get some Packer tickets, because I want to go watch this team demolish the Minnesota Vikings. Maybe head on over to Vivid Seats, use a promo code OVERTIME. Save up to 100 bucks on all ticket purchases, first-time customers only. Something to think about. But um, there is there is just an unbelievable... I can't believe how... I, I still haven't come down, man. I have not come down from it yet. I have not seen 10 o'clock at night in such a long time. And there I was sitting up at 10, 10.30, 11 o'clock. I just was not tired. So much adrenaline. And then I woke up jacked. Like, I don't remember the last time that happened. Like, I woke up and just picked up right where I left off. But there's so much to do. I'm, I'm kind of, generally the way I do it is I'm just going to give my thoughts and opinions just in a general macro sense. And then the next day we do advanced stats. and that I, It's all going to be kind of a blend. I'm just going to throw everything at the wall, see what happens. Because I would like to um, interview uh, Zach from the Bear Report. He's reluctantly agreed to <laughs> discuss what happened. Um, I would also like to, before the next game, talk to uh, the folks over at Grapes and Gorak, the Minnesota Vikings overtime podcast folks. The Facebook group is flush with comments and questions. My my uh, phone has been blowing up with text messages and questions. So there's there's just there's a ton to do. So I'm not worried about just hitting everybody. I don't need to spread anything out. There's almost too much before we have to turn our attention to the Vikings. So today is just going to be a little bit of everything. But before we kind of go to the break and everything else, I think the general macro look at how I'm approaching this is thusly. What I said in terms of just find a win. It's going to be ugly because it's September and it's week one and half of our team has never even set foot on a football field yet. Just find a way to win. That was absolutely true. Here's another way of looking at this. And it sounds like kind of a a cheap way out of just glossing over the bad stuff. But there's some logic to it. Generally, the way that I'm looking at this is this. Pay much more attention to the good than to the bad. Because the default is bad. You expect bad. So when certain facets of the game, when certain players, when certain whatever, when certain people come out and things go well, that's something that you could sink your teeth into. The Bears and the Packers' defense is coming out looking like they're in playoff form. That's not something to necessarily look at and go, mm, yeah, I don't know, we'll see. I mean, it is, because anything can happen. But that that's not expected. Where's the bad tackling? Where's the guys who don't know what they're doing? Where 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 is just the... the mass confusion and blown plays and all that that stuff should have happened and didn't now the flip side the the negatives lots of negatives for both teams these things are expected maybe not to the extent maybe the whatever but in general i want to focus more on the positives than the negatives from there i think you look at certain things and say it's not it doesn't mean nothing right there are certain things that you look at 
But not, not one negative thing is something to panic about. The only things that you really need to panic about are things that you can look at definitively and say, this is going to be a problem going forward. And really the only thing that would be an absolute negative, there's two things that would be a negative after yesterday's game, a loss and an injury. Neither of those things happened. Now from there, you can start to look at other things. There are things that maybe we need to keep an eye on, things that maybe we need to start questioning, things that maybe we can start at least exploring the topic of this is this is maybe a problem. And I think, again, after the break when we actually start the whole podcast thing, I want to start with that. And I know that's kind of a dangerous thing because some people are just going to go, eh, I'm not listening to him complain, which it's not really complaining. It's just, just talking. We're just talking here. But I, just, I want to get it out of the way because it was, it, it was just, it was, there was so much good. And I, I want to talk about that, but I just, I don't want to end the, pod, the podcast on a negative. I want to end the pod on a positive. So we'll just explore some of the negatives, some of the things that need to be tweaked, my general thoughts on it, and then we'll just move on to, uh, to the, the good. Also, um, some other little bits of news. Um, I know that the season has already started, so we're kind of already involved in it, but I did expand out the offer to anyone that is donating even a dollar on Patreon. So anybody that's giving anything on Patreon, uh, you're now welcome and able to um, join in on the CBS Pick and Pool, which essentially is just pick the games. It's just for fun, but uh, it, it'll be a fun little way to, I don't know, just kind of do something fun together. If you did not receive my email or would you, if you'd like to participate and you're, you know, donating on Patreon and, you know, you, you, you haven't heard from me or you don't know how to do it, just let me know and I'll, I'll get you hooked up. Speaking of fun little games and things to play, I need to tell you all about FanDuel because there is a lot of ways to win some cash prizes, lots of ways to play some games every single game, every single week. And if you haven't done it before, check out FanDuel because new users get $20 inside credit if you deposit 20 bucks, so they're going to match your 20 bucks basically. And I got to be honest, after watching that game, it just kind of gets you jacked up, right? I, I, when I did my mock draft, and in the seventh round, I was just thinking, you know what? I had the last pick in the seventh round. I'm thinking, I'm taking Jimmy Graham. I just got a feeling. Somebody snagged him about three picks before I did. And after watching Jimmy get that pick and, and just jumping up and freaking out, saying that's exactly what we needed him to do, seeing the utilization of the tight ends, it's like, man, I should have drafted him. Well, with FanDuel, you can because it's a weekly thing. You get to pick a new team every week. You know, injuries aren't going to mess up your whole season, none of that kind of stuff. And beyond that, the, the fantasy football league I'm running – it's all free. It's just for fun. This is this is for literally tens, hundreds, thousands, millions of dollars. So super jack to get up in there and uh, and start you know start laying it down. But again, sign up for FanDuel right now. Get twenty dollars in total bonuses. Just make your first deposit of twenty bucks, and then what they do is they give you five bucks a week every week for four weeks for a total of twenty bucks. So go to FanDuel.com/slash/DFS/Fantasy or download Fan the uh, the FanDuel app. Anyways, let's uh, let's take a break. And uh, I, there's there's so much we got to talk about. Ladies and gentlemen, let me ask you a question. Have you ever heard in your entire life of test driving a phone network? Well, now you have, because U.S. Cellular is going to let you test drive their network for free for 30 days. So anywhere you go where you got some dead spots, where your service isn't super strong, you're trying to listen to the podcast and it drops out when you go here because you got no internet service anymore, real simple. Just whip out your phone, do a little beep boop bop boop, that's you pushing the buttons to go to the right place, and you can get the app and try it out for yourself. So go ahead and test drive U.S. Cellular's award-winning network free for 30 days. That's U.S. Cellular, built for us. Terms apply. Awards based on open signal independent data. So go to uscellular.com for all the details. So as I said, I want to start with some of the negative, and, and clearly the offense was not a positive. And, you know, th there's a lot of different angles that we can take, and, and I think for the most part, almost every single thing that I can think of is either one of two things. One, the Bears' defense was on point. I mean, just dominant. Maybe not in exactly every facet, but everything that I could see, especially their front, and the other guy that really stood out to me watching it was Roquan Smith, was everywhere. That guy was flying, making tackles when we tried to get to the outside, and he was shooting gaps, getting into our backfield consistently. That was, if, if, if they're looking for a leap from him, they're, that was a great start. I haven't looked at his grade yet. I'll probably get to that point, but I, I was personally impressed. 
And then the second thing would just be not enough practice. I think there were several occasions, especially early. I think we tried to get super creative. I loved the play design. Just the execution was trash. You know, it was a it was a bad pass from Rodgers. You know, Corey Lindsley was late getting out, and he wasn't able to block the one guy, right? I mean, you got the whole defense flowing one way. There's literally one guy to block, and then 40 yards of green grass, and just Corey's just not paying attention to what he's supposed to be doing or, or a drop pass or whatever. Right, these things, you know, you practice it, you rehearse it, and you get a lesser talented defense. Some of this stuff is really going to take off. Another big note that I had, you know, Aaron Jones is is really, really good at just getting the ball and running instantly and squeezing behind these tiny gaps, but the Bears were so on point with just squeezing those gaps so fast. I mean, he was just about to get through it, and these guys just closed it in time. And, and you look at so many of his big plays, they're, they're fractions of seconds that he was able to slip through just before the defender got there. The Bears are just a half a tick faster, so it turns what would have been you know maybe an eight-yard gain into a one-yard gain or a zero-yard gain. The, the ultimate impact of it was seemed massive, but if you really just look at it, a little bit more practice, a little bit better play from our offensive line, a little lesser talented defense, and, and this is a, a night and day difference. The, the one thing that does concern me is the parallels, not in every way, but the certain things that parallel 2018 and, and perhaps even before that. Because the, the bottom line is, at some point, the excuses have to stop. And there's a lot of excuses, and that's why I'm not going to come down hard on it. But it's kind of the same problems and the same excuses we've been given for a long time, right? So 2017, Aaron Rodgers got hurt. Well, duh. Obviously, there's no, you know, the offense didn't look good because Aaron Rodgers was out the whole year. No big deal. 2018 rolls around real bad. Well, you know, I mean, uh, it's McCarthy's fault. And, and, and Aaron Rodgers has a, his knee hurts a little bit doesn't really explain why he can't throw the football very well and the passes aren't great and he's not throwing to his check downs. But, um, you know, I mean, it's McCarthy's fault and his knee hurts. Okay, that's fine. 2019 rolls around. You know, the passes are not, I mean, almost every single pass was, was either off, too hard, not hard enough, in the dirt. There weren't very many passes that were where you'd like it to be. Even, you know, the touchdown to Jimmy, it's fine. But it's like, maybe scoot that a little bit to the right, uh, you know. And again, you come into it, and it's like, okay, whatever, dude. It's Look at the pressure. Look at the offensive line play. Look at the, the fact that it's a new scheme. You know, look at the fact that he didn't take one single snap in the preseason. All these are great things, and, and all reasons why I'm willing to just be like, it's fine. It's not a big deal. But it, it, it gets to a point where I start to feel like I'm being dishonest. As in, if I was in a room full of Bears fans or Vikings fans, and I'm sitting there going, yeah, but, yeah, but, yeah, but, and I've literally been doing that. This is my third year in a row going, yeah, but there's a reason. It just it just makes me nervous. It kind of gets to the point, and it seems impossible. Aaron Rodgers is a good quarterback. Why did he just hit that guy in the feet? Five yards away from him, and he threw a rocket pass at the guy's feet. I feel like he could have taken some heat off and raised the ball up, you know, three feet, four feet. So it's, it's something to keep an eye on. It, it Again, there's nothing, even for the Bears, right? I, I would be concerned about Trubisky, but look at the first week last year. Packers beat the Bears. What did that mean ultimately by the end of the year? Nothing. It meant nothing. The Bears dominated the division. The Packers were garbage. So, you know, it doesn't mean Trubisky's going to be completely trash, even though I tend to think he's not good, as you are well aware. I think he's better than what he did yesterday. He better be, or that is just, he is the worst. He's not even the second best quarterback on his team. I don't even know if they have three quarterbacks on their roster, but he's not even the second best because there's a wide receiver somewhere that can throw better than what he did yesterday. But again, I'm just going to stash this in the category of something to keep an eye on. You know, we, we want to see certain things eventually. And that, that was actually one of the cool things about yesterday is there's a huge list of things, right? Every, every day, just about for months, I've been saying there's so many unknowns. There's so many unknowns. Every interview I've done, for every whatever, when people ask about the Packers, it's just there's just a lot of unknowns. I don't have answers. I don't know. And as the season goes on, you start to check these things off. And the expectation is, well, don't expect anything in September, maybe October, November. And then by December, you, you kind of hope that you have all the boxes checked or at least enough of the boxes checked to be good enough to get into the playoffs, win in the playoffs, et cetera, et cetera. 
the fact that so many boxes were checked, and I'm talking about with permanent marker, double check, triple check, X the box, just just rip the box out and throw it in the trash. I don't even want this box in my face anymore. The fact that so many of these boxes were, were highlighted, bolded, underlined. I'm not sure what it is we're trying to accomplish with this box, whether we want to really highlight it or throw it out. I don't know, but just do something to that box in a real extreme manner because it was it was just put a point on that. I did not expect this kind of a defensive, and I don't even care if the Bears are bad because I, I know, see, this is the thing. I don't know if Bears fans or Vikings fans or everybody else that's sitting there going, oh, whatever, it's one game. I don't think they realize what Packers defense is about. I don't think they understand that even on a good day, they're they're giving up big they're gonna give up the big play. They're gonna give up the third and forty. They're gonna give you know, second and forty, first and forty. They're they're giving it up. The fact that it just just and and oh man, there's so much going on in my brain I can't say eight things at once. Clutch is is maybe the best word I can think of. There there were so many pivotal moments and I you know, there are so many key times in a game where you say big play, right? This is a big play and you start saying it in the first quarter and you know you sound dumb saying it, but you still feel like it's a big play. Right, critical third down. It's not really, you know, we're five minutes into the first quarter, but, you know, whatever, still. This is, this is big, momentum, right? And the fact is the Packers just kept winning. And it, it was, it was we need somebody to make a play, and somebody made a play. You know, even Raven Green on that fluky thing where he stuck his arm out and and, and knocked the ball away. At the same time, by the way, that, that Rashawn Gary ends up smoking the quarterback to, to get the ball a little bit off course. And then as the wide receiver is about to adjust and actually catch that terrible pass, Raven Green knocks it away. I mean, it's just, it's the the fact that they never quit. And the fact that it's not just a matter of, you know, when you need one guy to make a play, one guy makes a play. When when the defense, when, when the Bears offense is looking for one guy to just make a mistake, just, I just need Jair to mess up one time. I need Kevin King to fall down one time. Just give me one mistake. They wouldn't do it. They, they locked in. That, it doesn't matter that it's one week. It doesn't matter that it was the Chicago Bears offense that wasn't playing well. Those are factors in, in terms of degrees, like in what degree of impressed are you. But the fact that it happened is a big deal and is something we should be excited about, and there's no question about that. Are they ever going to play that well again? I have no idea, but that is something to be awestruck by. A team that, and, and again, we, we know because we've watched this for years, even good Packers defenses, you'd be hard-pressed to find a performance like that. A Packers team scoring 10 points and winning the game is unbelievable. And again, this is week one. Week one, you're not even supposed to be good at tackling. Worst tackling team all throughout the preseason, by the way. Solid. And, in, and, 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 and not just that, but another thing that good... What I've said several times... A good defense swarms the ball. Every good defense you've ever seen, they swarm. There were a couple times when guys were not quite getting tackles, but every time you got one hand around, somebody else comes in. Well, you know, I, I can't remember specific plays, but you know, Blake getting in the backfield and kind of wrapping his arm, and he just slips through, and then just as the guy breaks free, here comes a guy. Boom, 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 another one, another one. That big third down stop, Kenny Clark, great per- penetration but if if Adrian Amos wasn't also there getting into the backfield grabbing his leg and throwing him on his head he probably still gets through it's it's not just that a guy did it it's that the team did it they worked as a unit they worked fast they played physical that is what a good defense is what we've had in the past is good players a good defense is a different thing it is it is a group that works as a unit. It's a mentality. It's 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 the story that Tremont told about the pick in which Adrian Amos said, Watch out for this play, it's coming. It's 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 intelligence and it's communication and it's energy and it's passion and it's all these things. And the Packers had that on week one and on a game when the Chicago Bears looked like they were the best team that I that I've ever seen, the best defense that I've ever seen. It was an unbelievable defensive performance. The Packers were even better unbelievable and 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 the fact of the matter is the the pro football focus grades are out and the grades are not all that impressive the stats are unbelievable right it, 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 it's not a big deal there's a lot of good with the grades and we'll um, we'll just let's just start now right but the the some of these stats are things that well let me give you let me give you one example here zadarius smith had 10 pressures in this game now if if you don't you know pressures isn't something that a lot of out limit. You can't just go to NFL.com. They're going to do pressures. They don't. They have sacks. Pressures is something that it's not tracked as easily. 
It's also a little subjective. But I wanted to try to see how unlikely it is to get um, 10 pressures. So I, I looked at some of the better pass rushers in the NFL. Khalil Mack, by the way, had three total pressures yesterday, just to give you an idea. Three pressures in the whole game. In 2018, the most pressures Khalil Mack has ever got in a game in 2018 was eight, and he did it twice. Eight. Akeem Hicks, the, the guy, another talented guy for the Bears in 2018, the most pressures he got in a game was seven. D. Ford had the most pressures of any player, any player in the NFL in 2018, more pressures than anyone. The most pressures he got in a single game was eight, and that's including the postseason, eight. J.J. Watt, the most pressures he's had in an entire game, eight in 2018, that is. Miles Garrett had nine pressures twice. He did not get to ten. Brandon Graham did have an 11 pressure game one time. By the way, that was in week 16, and this is out of 18 games. He had double-digit pressures one time. And then Jerry Hughes for the Buffalo Bills had a 13-pressure game, which is just out of control. But other than that, that was his only double-digit pressure game throughout the entire season. In week one, Zadarius Smith had 10. It's unbelievable. In all of last year, the most pressures any Packer had was 7 by Mike Daniels in week 8. And there were several weeks where four pressures was the most anybody got. The Packers had 31 total pressures in this game. 29 is the most pressures that the Packers had all year last year. 29. Which is, which is fine. I mean, it's, it's close. But again, we're talking about what the Packers were able to accomplish in their first attempt compared to the best effort the Packers had all last year. Now, this is almost entirely because of Zadarius and Preston. The, the third, Preston Smith, by the way, had six total pressures, which is a great number. The next highest, the third highest, was two. Now, that's not necessarily to be super discouraged because a lot of these guys didn't have a lot of attempts. Rashawn Gary had two pressures on six attempts, which is 33%, by the way. This is incredible. Darnell Savage had uh, two pressures on seven attempts. Uh, Blake Martinez, two pressures on four attempts. Kyler Fackrell had two on 15, which isn't bad. Raven Green had one on six. Kevin King somehow had a pressure on zero pass rush attempts. So apparently he wasn't even, it wasn't a designed pass rush. Maybe he was in coverage and was like, forget this, and went and just got the quarterback. I don't know exactly how that works, but kudos to him. And Adrian Amos had one pressure on three attempts. So for, for the most part, very few people had a lot of attempts and um, didn't get home. Uh, a few that did have a lot of attempts and didn't would be, for example, Kenny Clark. Not a big deal because I do think based on the quality of the run defense, I think there was an emphasis on kind of staying home and, and watching out for that. But, uh, you know, Kenny Clark, two on 41 attempts, and uh, Dean Lowry, two on 34 attempts. Again, another defensive tackle. And that's it. There, there's two defensive tackles that had a not great ratio. Everybody else was just on point. The, I think the next worst would probably be Kyler Fackrell, two out of 15, which is a pressure percentage of, of 13%, which is about the best anybody had all last year. By the way, Zadarius Smith right now rocking a 20% pass rush percentage. Now, I don't think that that's going to be sustained, but just to put that into perspective, th- th- that 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 is on track to be the best pressure percentage that anyone's going to have in the NFL. Aaron Donald ended the season on 15.4, and 15.4 is disgusting. It's unbelievably good. Zadarius was, is at 20 right now, currently. Now, it's, listen, it's, it's week one, things are sloppy, but I'm, I'm just telling you, maybe this isn't sustained, but this is incredible. And I don't even think on, on flukish occasions bad Packers defenses put up these kinds of performances. And again, the evidence isn't because some guys had, you know, you had, for example, Kyler Fackrell would have three sack games. That's cool, but the problem is you look at the full extent, uh, the full um, the full body of work, right? He wasn't great against the run. What about the other plays when he wasn't getting a sack? What was he doing? Not a lot. Look at the rest of the defense. Look at, the, look, look at everything else, and it was just kind of just holes everywhere. This is a different thing. Preston Smith, uh, six out of, what did I say it was? Six out of 46 is 13%. That's that's phenomenal. I mean, that's that's what Khalil Mack gets. He's at about 13% on the season. He's not right now because three pressures in a game. What What is he at? I got to see this. 
thanks to an elite offensive line comprised of David Bakhtiari and Brian Balaga primarily, Khalil Mack is currently rocking an 8.5 pressure percentage. Zero sacks, zero hits, three hurries. Now, that's going to go way up. And I think a lot of the guys around him benefited from the fact that there was so much attention to Khalil Mack. I'm, I'm not trying to whatever, but you want to talk about something to be proud of. How about zero sacks, zero hits, three hurries on 35 pass rush attempts from Khalil Mack? Khalil Mack is, is 13, 14, 15% pass rush percentage guy. 8.5% is trash, right? Dean Lowry is probably going to end the season at about 8.5%. Some other things to get really excited about. How about uh, six pass breakups? I think, uh, what was it, ESPN or CBS? I thought they said there was like nine. So obviously PFF has a different number. But six pass breakups is solid. Uh, Darnell Savage credited with a pass breakup. Raven Green credited with a pass breakup. Kevin King. Uh, Jair was credited with two pass breakups. And Tremont Williams. I mean, that that's that's our crew, man. That's that's the crew. That's everybody. It's, it's just, this is what I'm saying. It's it's everybody. And even, even the only guy you can maybe pick on is Tony Brown. I'm not even that upset. Tony Brown is our number three, number four, and whatever he is, and he's going up against their number one, and he gave up two passes, and both of those were a great effort by by um, whatever his name is. Who cares? He's a bear. I don't care. Forget his name. i got other stuff in my mind. Leave me alone. Right? I mean, you know, maybe a little bit of a better corner is able to figure that out, but whatever. Good pass, great catch, gets his feet down inside. And still, you still see that effort from Tony Brown. I It's one of those things with Tony Brown where even when he does, doesn't do it quite right and you get a little frustrated, there's something about the way he plays and the physicality and the energy, and it's just he looks like he's super, super passionate. He never looks like he's lazy, taking a playoff, you know, just not quite where he needs to be, flustered. He always just looks like he's given 110. Now, again, I, it, it doesn't super matter if you're not getting the job done, but I, I still really appreciate the effort that he puts in. Um, he was one of the few on the defense that didn't have a, a uh, average or above grade. Uh, but run defense, he had a great grade. Tackling, he had a great grade. But his coverage was low because he gave up some passes, right? I mean, it makes sense. Uh, he was targeted four times, gave up three receptions for 55 yards. Um, I mean, that's they're, they're going to ding you for that 116.7 passer rating when targeted. But, man, oh, man, there's a lot of good here. But, it, it, all right, so let's, this is this is all over the place, but whatever. Let's look at the defense and just go through some of these grades real quick. Now, it's not going to be as high as a lot of people think, well, so-and-so was elite. Then No, not really, but it's fine. We'll, we'll go through it. So defensively, there wasn't a lot of elite, but there also was basically everybody was pretty good with the exception of a few. So the guys that were, there were only four players that were graded below average. Zero people had a bad grade. Not one defender was given a bad grade. Now, in certain categories, people had bad grades. But overall, and you got guys like Dean Lowry who had a 28.6 tackling grade, which is abysmal, still ended up with a 55.8. And again, 60 is average. But Tony Brown was the lowest graded, whatever. Um, then Dean Lowry, then Josh Jackson, then Tyler Lancaster. And, and Tyler was 59.8. He was basically rated average. Every other player was, was um, average or above. And really, there were only, let's see, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5... Well, there's, okay, so there's one, two, three, four that were average, and then there's three guys that were at 69. So basically, 70 is good, so basically, I'm just going to say they were good. So you got four other guys that were considered average. Raven Green, I know a lot of people aren't going to like that. He had an average grade. Um, let, let's go through his stat line real quick. He was given, by the way, a very good and in the, very good tackling grade. It was in the 80s, but his coverage was meh, pass rush meh, run defense meh. He had one total pressure, uh, six total tackles, one assisted tackle, three stops, which are, you know, tackles that matter. Uh, and then he was targeted six times, gave up four receptions, passer rating when targeted 70.1. And again, he did have a pass breakup and, an, an, uh, no, not an interception. That's Amos. Getting my, getting my guys mixed up here. But, but again, I, I, a solid effort. Nothing negative. I don't think PFF is saying anything negative. He's, it, basically, every grade he had was, was average, and he graded out average. It's just his tackling was, was solid. Uh, other guy that was graded as average, and I think it's fair because his tackling was a little suspect, but Blake Martinez, uh, his run de defense grade was below average, but still very close to average. His tackling was below average, but close to average. His coverage was below average, but close to average. His, his uh, NFL passer rating when targeted was 100.7. He gave up uh, five receptions on six targets, which is not a number you want to see. It's a not a very good ratio, 
uh, gave up fif basically 50 yards through the air, 9.8 per uh, per whatever throw. I don't, I can't think. But his pass rush grade was was through the roof. Now the reason that doesn't weight super high is because he only rushed the passer four times, but it was it was very very good. And again for week one, a couple of bad tackles, couple of this that or the other. I you know Blake was on point. I think he's you know he's the field general in the middle of that defense. He's calling out the plays. He's getting everybody lined up. I, I'm super happy with where he's at. And he didn't have any help. They I, I, as far I'm not sure if this is true or not. There's a rumor floating around that there was not one time a second linebacker, which you want to talk about crazy. This is a team that is deciding we're going to run the ball. We're going to smash it down their throat. Petten comes out and says, that's cute. We're going to do one linebacker. We're going to stay in our nickel and, and dime defense the entire game. We'll see what you can do. And the big boys up front, Mr. Uh, um, Mr. Kenny Clark, Mr. Montravius Adams, um, Tyler Lancaster, they're just going to hold it down. You're not going to be able to run, right? Preston, Zadarius, Rashawn, these are the big boys up front. This is our revamped defense, the big guys, the long arms. They're not super good gap shooters. They're not going to bring as much pressure, but you will not run on these guys. And it doesn't even matter if we don't have two linebackers. We don't need two linebackers because the guys up front are going to handle their business. Unbelievable. Uh, Kyler Fackrell, average, uh, basically every grade across the board was average, except his tackling was below average. Not super surprising. That's pretty par for the course for him, but he only had 22 uh, total snaps. Pretty much a designated pass rusher. Only once did he play when it was a run play, and I'm sure it was not anticipated to be a run play. He was 15 plays as a pass rusher, six he dropped in coverage. But um, again, out of the 15, he had two total pressures, no sacks, no hits, but two hurries. He had no tackles, no assisted tackles, obviously no missed tackles, no stops, no forced fumbles. He was never targeted in coverage. He had zero, 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 everything. And then the only other guy that was average, 66, which is a mediocre, mid-average, high-average, however you want to call that, uh, was Mr. Montravius Adams. Um, his biggest thing, not a super great pass rusher, but uh, his tackling was, was high average and his run defense was good. He had a good run defense grade, which, again, that's, that's really going to be the key, I think, for this defensive line. Um, as much as I expect Kevin, or Kenny Clark's uh, pass rush production to go up because he's just very good at it and it's going to be you know, different teams. you got different strategies and things. But I really do think that was the, the goal here is I, I need the big boys to be able to just make sure they can't run and we're going to force Trubisky to throw. That was the plan. They did force him to throw. And the challenge was, and th this is how it works, right? This is our main plan, and if we can execute it, you're going to have to change what you're doing. So their plan was to run. Our plan is to make sure you can't run. We stopped you from running. Now you need to throw. If you can't adjust and throw, which they did adjust, all right, fine, we'll throw, but if Trubisky can't execute, you lose, and that's what happened. right? It's supposed to be we do this, and then you do this, and then when you do that, then we have to adjust, but we never had to adjust because <laughs> they couldn't execute. And that's how you end up scoring uh, three points and losing. Oh, I'm so happy with the world right now. Um, and again, everybody else was basically um, good, right? You know, a, a couple of guys were bordering on very good, but I'm just going to keep going because there's only a few more to cover. The next best this is the 10th overall, uh, given a good grade, was Tremont Williams. I was so happy with Tremont. Just, I, as, as I've said, I do think he's our number two, although Kevin King, man, he's on his he's on his way to, to proving me wrong. I don't think he was perfect. But um, it just, the, the stat line looked great. I don't remember anybody catching a pass on him. That was incorrect, and we'll go over his stats. But anyways, we'll get there. But still, Tremont is just solid. He's incredibly smart. You look at that play when um, Allen Robinson is the name I couldn't think of before. When he caught that pass, Tremont knew that he just had to make sure he didn't get that second foot down. He hits him in sort of that upward direction to make sure he doesn't get his weight down and he can't get his foot down gets him out of bounds, stops that play. And it, it's it's that kind of stuff that I'm talking about. It's the intelligent play, the smart play, the quick play, being on point, doing the right thing at the right time. I absolutely love that. But uh, Tremont was, was absolutely on point. He didn't have any below average grades across the board. He was fine. Um, he had an average pass rush grade, but only had one attempt. Uh, his run defense grade uh, was basically mediocre, but his coverage grade was was good. And his tackling grade was great. Um, I just super excited about Tremont. I just think he's clutch. You know, he's he. I don't think he's an elite player, but I, that's the thing. And I, I've mentioned this before. When you look at the guys that they started targeting, these aren't necessarily like elite, crazy, like super good. They're just consistent and they're solid. Adrian Amos, consistent, solid. Preston, Zadarius, Tremont. 
These are guys that aren't going to, you know, they're sort of the antithesis to the Kyler Fackrells, where it's it's a lot of bad, but there's also a lot of really flashy good. I feel like the Packers are getting away from that. I want guys that are going to show up and be consistent on every play. Tremont is the embodiment of that, and I, I just, I, I really, really like Tremont Williams. Uh, the next highest was Kenny Clark. Again, I, I, I think his role was to stay put. You know, he did have a lot of pass rush attempts and didn't necessarily get home, but, um, you know, I, th- I think the ball did come out relatively quick. The, the pressure overall was solid. The, the plan as it is worked. And overall, you know, he, he was the, the one average grade, and it wasn't even a bad grade. They gave him an average pass rush grade, and again, that's going to come up. Maybe different situation, you know, again, when we have to adjust, they're going to have to start bringing some pressure, and Kenny's just going to, you, you know what he's going to do. Uh, but he had a good tackling grade. He had a borderline very good run defense grade because it's Kenny Clark, and he's a monster. Um, the eighth best player on defense was Mr. Darnell Savage, another guy that I'm just super blown away by. Um, it is just one week. It wasn't a perfect outing, but Darnell Savage, I, I was saying coming into this game, I don't know if he's really going to start or if he's going to be a rotational guy or, you know, maybe, maybe because we trust Raven Green a little more, he's basically going to be number two. Darnell's going to be the number three, but, um, yeah, I mean, it, 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 you, you just saw it, right? Everything you saw on film in college, just that athleticism, and, and not just having it. Josh Jones has it. He couldn't put it into action. Darnell Savage, week one, with very minimal experience through the preseason and training camp, comes out, and you just saw it, where he's he's kind of baiting the guy. He stands back a little bit, and, man, when that ball's out, he shoots out of a cannon and just swats the ball. And there were several times when the, the, the receiver, I think Tariq Cohen had a really good one where he caught it, and he just shouldn't have, right? That it, that was just an unbelievable effort by a, I guess we're calling him a wide receiver now, unbelievable effort by by Tariq Cohen because Darnell Savage, by all rights, should have just swatted that ball away, and he he did everything perfect. Um, again, Darnell Savage isn't perfect, but if this is him just starting to learn, I mean, I, I don't know what else to expect. I mean, he did have a, a bad tackling grade. They, they did not like his tackling. I do remember some occasions, which and that, that hopefully will get better because you, you can just see it where he's flying, right? This guy's getting out to the sideline. Somebody comes flying in like a missile and misses. Whatever, right? I mean, hopefully that gets better because how valuable he's going to be. And that's that's sort of a big thing with college, right? He was able to do certain things in college that's just different now. Bigger Guys are bigger. Guys are faster. You're not going to get away with what you got away with in college. That's going to come with time. But that kind of speed and athleticism, um, just just awesome. Uh, he had, again, he had two total pressures, one hit and one hurry. He had three tackles and one missed tackle. Uh, one of his tackles was a stop. He was targeted four times, gave up three receptions. Again, not a great ratio, but only 17 yards, 5.7 yards per reception. Only two yards after the catch, so he was just right there making the, the tackle. His The longest that he gave up was seven yards. And uh, he did have one pass break up, a total passer rating when targeted of 82.3, which is not bad at all. And again, it, it wasn't so much the stat sheet. It wasn't so much that he was perfect. It was just the fact that there's certain attributes of Darnell Savage that, that you want to see. This is another checkbox situation where I expected nothing from Darnell Savage. I expected him to be raw and sloppy and mess everything up and, and blow coverages and, and people catching passes over that way. And instead, you just saw a guy that was just doing exactly what I was hoping to see by by November. I was hoping to see this kind of production from Darnell Savage later in the year. Again, not perfect. His, his grade was basically a 70, which is good. But to have that and 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 the way that he's good, to, to see that athleticism, to see the guy shooting into the backfield from the safety spot because he's so fast. You know, when, when guys like Blake are, are shooting back and they almost tackle but don't quite, and you need somebody to come up and make a hit, and he's coming from deep safety to come up and make the hit. You know, he missed the tackle, but that's the kind of thing where if he starts – refining that if he starts being the guy that actually wraps up and makes a tackle he's going to be such a difference maker for this defense it's unbelievable uh fatal brown was technically number seven he only had two total plays um and they were both pass rush plays and he didn't really do anything with it but apparently he graded out well enough to be the, the seventh best at number six is kevin king um i i for the i, I would say that everything that i said coming into this game was 100 percent correct everything that i've said over the years or the months of about mitchell trubisky has been correct everything i said about it's going to be sloppy but just get a win everything i said about rashawn gary and we'll get to that was correct everything i've said about zadarius everything i said about adrian amos everything i've said about everybody has been as far as i can tell through week one i don't think there's anything that i need to walk back kevin king although not perfect very, very happy 
with what I saw. Kevin King is the kind of guy in my mind that prior to this, and, and listen, I never said Kevin King was necessarily going to be bad. I said he wasn't great in the past and that he's overinflated, and I stand by that. I don't think that what he does today changes what he did yesterday. But I also went on to say that I don't necessarily have a high level of confidence that he's going to turn this around, and one week doesn't make anything definitive, and he did have a, a bad tackling grade, and his coverage grade was was mediocre. It was close to good, but not quite. It was 67. And his run defense was was mediocre. But overall, this is a guy who ended up getting a sack. This is a guy who had four tackles. One missed tackle, but whatever. Three of those tackles were stops, because that is one thing Kevin King does very, very well, is that he is another guy that is super fast, shot out of a cannon, but he's a hard hitter. So a lot of his tackles are big, consequential tackles. A lot of his tackles are him flying up and just smoking a guy behind the line of scrimmage. Very fast, very big. He was targeted four times, only two of those were caught. Of those two, he only gave up 14 yards, which isn't bad, 11 yards after the catch, which, you know, not super great. And he ended up with a pass breakup, 58.3 NFL passer rating when targeted. Now, this isn't elite level caliber stuff. I don't want, I shouldn't say it this way, but I, I could not care any less, really. My exp- I, I'm not going to be the guy that says, well, you know, he's not, he's not elite, so it doesn't count. You know, he's a second round pick, he should be, but I don't care if he's not elite. Forget elite. I just am tired of really bad corner play. I'm tired of the defense doing well, and then the the guy just gives up a big play. I just want consistent, solid play. Just don't give up the boneheaded play, the oops, I forgot I was supposed to do this play. If you give up a couple here, you you mess up there, you know, you lose the 50, like the Tony Brown stuff, right? You didn't mess anything up. It was just, the, it was it was a great contest. You did a great job being in the guy's chest, but you got Allen Robinson, who's a very good receiver, was just better on that play. Cool, man. Whatever. It's fine. I just want Kevin King to be, just just be consistent. Just be solid. I don't need you to be a top 10 corner. J- just be a, 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 a legitimate number two. Just be a guy that, that can that can compete. Be a guy that when, when a good corner or a good wide receiver rolls into town, I don't have to go, oh, great, Kevin King's going to get destroyed. And I'm not changing my opinion. I'm still concerned. There's a lot of concerns. I don't know what Savage is going to do. I don't know what King's going to do. I don't know any of this stuff. But but one of the things, one of the checkboxes is we need to see Kevin King get better. And if you're in the camp that says he's always been good, he's just hurt, I don't buy it, but fine. Either way, both of us want him to be better, injury or not. And I think this was a great effort. This was He was the sixth highest graded player. Fantastic effort, regardless of the grades. He made the tackles when he needed to make a tackle. He was not. He didn't give up the big plays. Maybe it was just because the quarterback didn't didn't throw it to him. I don't know. I'm going to go back and watch the game, and, and you can watch it with me, by the way, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. But th- that's all I'm asking for. You know, he dropped a pick. You know, he probably should have caught it. The ball did get swatted away. But, you know, again, week one, he's in the right spot. He made sure it wasn't caught, and he just he just didn't mess up. Like, if, if I just don't hear your name, I'm happy. I didn't hear Kevin King's name. I didn't see Kevin King. I completely forgot about Kevin King. In my opinion perfect corner more than content with the guy that i that i forget every single week that he's playing because the ball just doesn't go that way and that's what richard sherman's entire career was i mean you you knew he was there because he was violent and chippy and he had a big mouth and all that stuff but for the most part i mean he just shut down one half of the field the ball never went that way and that was it anyways number five on our countdown of pff grades jair alexander Now, Jair kind of followed in line with a lot of other stuff. The tackling was not good. There were several people that had some poor tackling. Um, Run defense was was technically bad. Uh, Tackling was actually very bad. It was in the 30s. Run defense was 40s, bordering on 50. But the fact of the matter is 14 of his snaps were in run defense, 57 in coverage, and he was the highest graded coverage guy on the team, which is exactly what you want to see from the number one corner Fantastic stats. Uh, we'll get through the tackling garbage. Three tackles, two assisted tackles, one miss, uh, two stops, whatever, who cares. He was targeted eight times. Only three were caught. 37.5 reception percentage. That is the lowest of any corner. Tremont, by the way, i got to give him credit. He was targeted 11 times, only gave up six. It was 54.5, um, which, you know, to be targeted that many times, but to, to stop, I mean, essentially to make sure that, that that many passes were not caught is a great effort. But anyways, back to Jair, eight or three out of eight is unbelievable. 
Of that three, it was 37 yards, which is a pretty big percentage. 12.3 yards per reception is kind of a lot, but um, whatever. The 21-yard reception was really the, the reason that that came out to be that way. Um, and then, then logged two pass breakups in this game. Just an unbelievable effort from Jair. A great start to the season. Again, I you know, I, I, I just I worry about this stuff, especially corners, because I'm super, I don't know, I just, I'm pessimistic about it, because we've seen such bad corner play. I mean, it's really only been, what, four years or something since we had, four or five years ago, we had really good defensive backs. But I'm just, I don't know, I'm raw. But it, it just, it feels so good. It's such a sigh of relief to have, to have you know, Jair be our, our fifth best player to have um, Adrian Amos, who we'll get to, as being the number one spoiler alert, and Kevin King being number six, just it just it feels great. I mean, there's only 18 players, but of the top 10, Tremont, Darnell Savage, Kevin King, Jair Alexander, and Adrian Amos, half of the five of the top 10 were defensive backs. That just feels incredible. Uh, the fourth highest player on the team was Mr. Zadarius Smith. Uh, his tackling grade was was really poor, which is why it was so low. Uh, which is, you know, it is what it is. Things got to get worked on. He he just kind of missed a couple opportunities there. We saw him miss, actually, and he, he could, should have had two sacks in the game, but he lost one. But um, his run defense grade was actually pretty decent, which is not actually what he's very good at, right? I talked about that, I think, yesterday or the day before. Um, not the greatest, but pass rush is exactly what he does. Now, his pass rush grade, you think, would be higher considering the circumstances, but it just, it was about 70, so they gave him a good grade. But again, 10 pressures. He had one sack, two hits, and seven hurries, which is just phenomenal. Um, he only had two tackles in the game and one missed tackle, which is a horrific ratio. 50% is not what you're looking for. I guess it's not really 50%. It's out of three attempts he missed one, but whatever. Two to one is the ratio. Um, both tackles were stops, which when you're closer to the line of scrimmage, you're going to have more consequential tackles, but whatever, still pretty solid. Otherwise, it was zeros across the board. He never dropped into coverage, so we don't have to worry about any of that stuff. Um, again, this is a situation where typically the grades are a little bit more telling than the stats. This is a situation where maybe the grades are saying that certain things need to be cleaned up, but the stat line is, is just, it just, it's, it's what matters ultimately, right? Because again, I don't care about ugly at this part of the season. I just care about find a way, you know, maybe it was ugly, but he found a way to get seven hurries, two hits and a sack in this game. More than happy with that. Number three, highest graded player. Guess who? I, I would like, uh, if, if I could get all the Rashawn Gary ha- haters to please come to the front of the class. I have something to show you so you can see this up close. Now, he's only in for six snaps. That's fine. But guess what? They were a pretty good six sacks. Remember that, that play I referenced before? Very pivotal part of the game where uh, Raven Green broke up that pass, stuck out his arms like a jet airplane, and it smacked the back of his arm. Essentially how that play broke down. Critical part of the game bordering on getting a touchdown. Very, very close. Raven Green did break that up. It was an underthrown pass. Here's the thing, though. If Trubisky doesn't get hit, Raven Green's trailing. If that ball gets thrown where it needs to get thrown and he throws a good ball, which is not a guarantee, but that's an automatic touchdown. Raven Green was not in position. It was only because it was underthrown. Why was it underthrown? Because he got smacked right in the mouth. Who was it that did it? Mr. Rashawn Gary. I'm, this is not hyperbole, and there are several situations where you can say this maybe, you know, Adrian Amos won the game. This J.K. Scott won the game. But it is not hyperbole necessarily to say that we only won this game because of Rashawn Gary. If Rashawn Gary had not been playing, we very well may have lost this game because that, that, that was a touchdown. Raven Green broke up the pass, but the only he was trailing, man. He was behind him. If that's an accurate pass in the corner of the end zone, that's a touchdown. Granted, there's no... Um, expectation he's going to make the extra point but that's a separate issue bottom line is Rashawn Gary was drafted to be a guy that blows a play up and he blew that play up that's his job he had six only six times he was in on this this game all six times he was asked to rush the passer twice out of six attempts he was disruptive he hit the quarterback once he hurried the quarterback once and again that hit very well may have won us the game again there's several points Amos J.K. Uh, Preston Smith, Zadarius Smith. I mean, there, there's several keys. You take this guy out, we may have very well lost. Take that guy out, we may very well, well may have lost. But Rashawn Gary is in that list. And I don't want to hear any nonsense about he wasn't on the st- stat sheet. Yeah, maybe not for NFL.com or ESPN, but guess what? He is on the stat sheet again because he was in the preseason as well. Only six attempts, he had a, a hit in a hurry. 
Number two on defense. This is going to be a long podcast, ladies and gentlemen. Number two on defense, Preston Smith. Six total pressures. He had a sack, a hit, and four hurries. He also added a batted pass, two tackles, one assisted tackle, one missed tackle, three stops out of his, uh, how many tackles? So all three, the, the two tackles and the assisted tackle were all stops. Um, and he did have 10 plays in coverage, but uh, no targets, no nothing as far as anything passing related. So just, you know, again, solid effort across the board. The, the batted pass, that was a big play. And almost picked off, if I remember correctly. And actually, if I also, if I remember, I, I think that was something that he was... I, I remember certain people looking back at his career, and that was like a thing, where it was like he was intelligent and had several batted passes. Well, he's got one already for the Packers. Uh, as far as his grades, the coverage grade was average. Pass rush grade was, was high-ish average. Run defense grade was phenomenal, which is his, his main calling card. That's what he does best. And like several other people, his tackling grade was was subpar. It was it was technically bad, and that leads us to the number one player on the Packers' defense, and I believe on the entire team because there weren't very many good grades on the offense. But Adrian Amos, um, he had of his three pass rush attempts, he did have one hurry. He had two tackles, one assisted tackle, zero missed tackles. One of those was a stop. Um, he was not targeted one time, so zero targets, zero receptions, et cetera, et cetera, but he did have one interception. Why is that not considered a target? Probably because they're putting that in Tremont Williams' category. I don't know exactly how they break it down, but that's how they break it down. Overall, as far as his grades, his one negative was technically just very rarely, very, a little bit below average is what I'm trying to say, was uh, pass rush. Uh, his run defense and coverage grades were both uh, categorized as good, and his tackling grade was very good. He had the highest tackling grade of anybody. So just running through these specific categories here, Kenny Clark had the best run defense grade. Amos was the highest uh, tackling grade, and there were three in the very good category, Adrian Amos, Tremont Williams, and Raven Green. Pass rush grades, Kevin King and Blake Martinez, very good grades. And then coverage, uh, the top one, as I said, was Jair Alexander. And since I went super in-depth on that, let's talk about offense. I won't go quite as long because it's not as uh, exciting. There was not one player on the entire offense that had a good grade. Not one. Now, please keep in mind, because I know, well, how could you not say Balaga, et cetera, et cetera. They do not take into account competition. That is, you can say that that's a flaw with their system. I don't necessarily see it as a flaw. I think it's just a matter of you need to understand how their grades work to understand what exactly it is we're talking about. So it's, it's context, I guess, and just understanding things. But the highest graded player, and there were, there were people that had good grades in certain categories, and that does include offensive linemen and their, their pass blocking abilities. So keep that in mind. But anyways, the highest graded player um, was Jimmy Graham. Super excited about that. Uh, it was a 67.2, which is, you know, high average. The other thing to note, there wasn't a lot of real bad. There, there was only one player that had a bad grade. Everybody else was was below average, and that was just uh, numbers 11 through 16 were below average, but not not bad. Mercedes was the only bad one, and I, I actually I was pleasantly surprised with Mercedes Lewis. I know he's not the fastest cat in the world. Probably could have caught an extra one and whatever, whatever, but um, whatever. That it is what it is. Um, the the I'll just go based on their color coding. There's there's guys in the 60s that have like a light green hue. I'll just say what those were. So the the highest graded offensive players, number one, Jimmy Graham, number two, Billy Turner, then number three, Brian Balaga, number four, Robert Tanya, number five, MVS, and then number six was Jamal Williams. Going through the specific categories here, uh, passing grade, which I don't exactly know what all goes into that. I don't know if it's just receiving or what, but uh, Jamal was the highest. He did actually have a good grade in that. Uh, The only one that had a bad grade was Mercedes Lewis. Actually, that's a lie. I forgot 50s are... Oh, no, 50s are below average, so I'm just going to say with Mercedes Lewis. Um, Geronimo was the next lowest. He was in the below average category, but I feel like that's worth noting. Uh, Not a great day for him as a receiver. Pass blocking, there were several pretty good grades here. Um, Aaron Jones actually had the highest grade, which is surprising because Jamal Williams did a good job, and he did. He's number two as far as pass blocking goes. Now, you know, again, competition level is a separate situation here they're maybe not always going up against the hardest to block guys and they're also getting guys that are just trying their best to get around tackles and they're always not in the best position to to come at you so you're whatever you know i'm trying to contextualize but they did a really good job uh other guys that did well basically pretty much everybody david bakhtiari mercedes lewis robert tanyan 
Um, Lane Taylor, Brian Balaga all had good grades. Jimmy Graham actually was very close. It was a high average. And then Danny Vitale also. But it drops. Uh, Danny Vitale was a 68.8, so basically right at good. Then there's two other guys, and it just drops down to horrific. Corey Lindsley, really bad in pass blocking. Billy Turner, really bad in pass blocking. We'll get into specific stats in a minute here, but that's how that broke down. Run grades, obviously, everybody was not great. They were all below average, right? You know, 56, 58, 59. And then run blocking, as you would expect, most were not great. However, a couple people that stood out, Geronimo, nobody cares because he's a wide receiver. Billy Turner, who was horrific as a pass blocker, but he did have a good outing as a run blocker. And Brian Balaga, who was just apparently pretty good at everything. Uh, The one guy that was terrible was Devontae, but again, who cares? Two other guys that were considered bad, Lane Taylor and David Bakhtiari, as run blockers. And then uh, penalties, which... um, I'll, I'll highlight a little bit. David Bakhtiari had two. Aaron Rodgers had two. And that does factor into the grade. So it's like, why did David Bakhtiari not have this super elite grade? Really bad in run blocking. Two penalties. Not great. Uh, Trevor Davis, Lane Taylor, and Brian Balaga all had penalties. Looking at the specifics here, there were uh, five sacks given up. Nobody had more than one. But Corey Lindsley, Billy Turner, Lane Taylor, David Bakhtiari, and Aaron Rodgers were all credited with sacks. How did Aaron Rodgers do that? Basically, they're looking at it and saying that was his fault. That was a quarterback's fault. They're not going to put that on an offensive lineman. And I think it's kind of cool that they do that. If Aaron Rodgers is holding the ball too long or whatever the case may be, it's not really right to put it on an offensive lineman. In fact, I can think of exactly what play that was now that I'm thinking about it because I remember sitting there going, why are you bragging? He was holding the ball for 19 seconds. Um, Aaron Rodgers has only hit once. That was uh, they put that on Aaron Rodgers is his fault. And there were eight hurries in this game. Corey Lindsley gave up two hurries. Billy Turner gave up two, and then Lane Taylor, David Bakhtiari, Brian Balaga, and Aaron Rodgers gave up four. So uh, Aaron Rodgers, they're saying, gave was was responsible for one sack, one hit, and one hurry. As far as total pressures, there were 14 given up. Please keep in mind, Zadaria Smith had 10 by himself, um, but Corey Lindsley. Uh, Billy Turner and Aaron Rodgers were credited with three of the pressures. Lane Taylor and David Bakhtiari for two, and Brian Balaga with one. Nobody else gave up anything. I'm seeing if there's any offensive linemen. I think that's all the offensive linemen. But uh, kudos to the the tight ends, who apparently gave up nothing. Uh, Robert Tanyan. Let's see, who was in for... Trying to see who had the most pass blocking reps that didn't give anything up. Uh, Aaron Jones had six. Jamal Williams had four. Mercedes had three. Tanyan had two. Vitali and Jimmy Graham all had one time in pass blocking. Not one of those fellows gave up a single pressure. Um, Aaron Rodgers, you know, obviously he didn't grade out all that well. Um, it wasn't as bad as as you might think. Is a 56.1, which is below average. Um, but it, I mean, it was it was ugly. Uh, he completed 60% of his passes, 203 yards, one touchdown, no interceptions, sacked five times, uh, one drop, one throw away, 91.4 passer rating. Um, on the positive side, when there was no pressure, he was given a 67.4 grade, adjusted completion percentage of almost 70%, which adjusted per- percentage is basically just not counting the drops and the th- throwaways and stuff. It's just when you have time to throw the ball to the guy, uh, was it an accurate pass? And the answer was yes, 70% of the time when he was kept clean. His stats when there was no pressure, uh, 17 completions on 26 attempts, which is 65.4, again, 69% adjusted, uh, 198 yards. So only five yards he had uh, when he was under pressure. 7.6 yards per attempt, and his touchdown came when he was not under pressure. When he was under pressure, one completion, four attempts, 25% completion percentage for five yards. 39.6 39.6 NFL passer rating. Uh, the receivers, I pretty much went through the grades already. Um, as far as yards, nothing super spectacular. MVS had 52 yards. Obviously, almost all of that came on his 47-yard reception. Um, after that, Devontae had 36, uh, Jimmy had 30, Tanya 28, Trevor 28, Jamal 15, Mercedes 14. Uh, yards per reception, Robert Tanya and Trevor Davis had 28 yards per reception. Um, yards after the catch, Jamal and Devontae had 21 yards after the catch, so that's pretty solid. First downs, Devontae was the guy. He was the guy that came up clutch. We saw several of those um, where they needed that big first down, and he was the one to come up with it. The only drop of the day was credited to Mercedes Lewis, so a pretty good effort across the board of, of just hanging on to the ball, coming up big and on a you know 
situation where things are pretty rough, you don't need to be adding to the problems. And then uh, as far as passer rating, Robert Tanyan and Trevor Davis, because they had almost identical, they did have actually exactly identical stats with the exception of yard after the catch. But 118.8 was their passer rating when targeted. Um, Marquez, 110. Jimmy Graham, 104.2. Everyone else was uh, below that. The only penalty of the wide receivers was on Trevor Davis, who had that false start, which was frustrating. And then uh, we'll, we'll take a look here at special teams. Um, not a whole lot, obviously. Again, special teams is usually a ton of people. Almost all of them are exactly average. The two guys that stood out a little bit, the only guy who had a good grade was Jamal Williams, and I specifically remember him going down and lighting somebody up. Uh, the other guy that was pretty close to good was Will Redmond. Guys that stood out as being pretty terrible, uh, Robert Tanyan and Trevor Davis had a pretty poor grade. I don't think that factors in returns, but it doesn't matter because he didn't return anything anyways. Uh, it doesn't, because if you look at his return grade, it was exactly six or 60.1, probably because he didn't really return anything, like I said, so you can't really grade very much. Um, as far as the kicking grades, J.K. Scott had a 70, which is a good grade. Uh, again, it's very rare that you find people that have very high grades. I'm frustrated by that. I'm going to write them a very angry letter that J.K. Scott should be getting a 90, which is an elite grade, because boy, oh boy, was that fun to watch. Um, his hang time was actually only 4.45 average, which is surprising, but I think a lot of these were line drives because he was banging the absolute tar out of these balls. 428 total yards. Uh, his yards per attempt, 47.6. His longest was 63 yards. And again, they, I hate the stats. Yards per attempt is low, 47.6, because some of these he's trying to pin inside, right? Net is dumb because that has to do with your guys going down and tackling him. It has nothing to do with the punter. So yards per attempt, yards and net yards are useless. Longest matters because on one of these attempts, you're probably going to kick it as far as you can, and it was 63 yards, and that's incredible. Um, pinned inside the 20, five punts out of nine. That's that's just awesome. I mean, he, he was so clutch on the day. I mean, almost every single one of these kicks was either just he knocked it out of the sta out of the stands or he kicked it inside of the 10, or in, at least inside of the 20. Several were inside of the 10. So J.K. Scott was just incredible, and, and Mason Crosby, he hit his one field goal, he hit his one extra point, so he was he was on, on point with that. The only other note, oh, there's two things I want to mention. Uh, the only other note as far as this game is to maybe just ease into the whole Amos versus HaHa Clinton Dix debate. HaHa Clinton Dix had the highest grade of any player on either side of the ball on either team. He was the only player to get an elite grade. 90.0 was his final grade. His coverage grade was an 83.7, which is higher than anybody on the Packers team, I believe. Tackling grade was an 80.8, and his run defense was a 75.9. His pass rush grade was low, but he only had three attempts. He had five tackles with zero missed tackles. Like I walked when I went over the stats before about Haha Clinton Dix, I said it's a myth that he had a, a ton of tackles, more than most safeties, and he had very, very few missed tackles. Almost everybody with the amount of tackles he had had way more misses. Today already, five tackles, zero misses. He was only targeted once on the entire day, and it was not caught. NFL passer rating of 39.6. So, yes, super excited about Amos. I'm very happy we have Amos. I would prefer Amos. I think he's better in coverage than HaHa Clinton Dix is. All that stuff is true. But please understand, we're judging Amos and HaHa Clinton Dix based on how many times we saw them. We only saw one guy get a pick. Amos played phenomenal. Ha ha, Clinton Dix had a very good day. That's all I'm saying. And if you want to say he wasn't as good, that's fine. But, you know, just just back off a little bit. It feels good that we basically won the game because of Amos, and that's awesome, and you can throw that in anybody's face. But just, just understand, ha ha, Clinton Dix is off to a pretty good start. That's all I'm saying. And actually, beyond shocked right now, because apparently Roquan Smith had the lowest grade of anybody, her terrible tackling grade, and his coverage was abysmal. So that makes me actually very happy. He did have five tackles, so I'm sure, you know, again, I saw him make tackles, and he did. He made five tackles, but uh, he also missed two tackles and apparently did a lot of other really bad stuff. Anyways, now I'm just kind of rambling to myself as I'm looking over some of these numbers. Uh, the other thing I wanted to talk about, and I'm going to try to do it today. There's a lot of stuff I want to get done. I might just actually do it right now as soon as I'm done with this. But I want to start doing, for the people on Patreon, feel free to jump in, but start doing some film reviews. And I want to start, I'm assuming it's going to be up on Game Pass. I want to go back and just start watching. And I want to do several things, right? So maybe we go back and look at the pass rushers or go back and look at the corners. I don't even know what I would do today. Um, you know, go back and look at just Darnell Savage. 
watch the wide receiver. What's going on with the pass game, right? Why, why were guys open and he wasn't throwing the ball? Were guys open and the pass rush just got there? What, what went wrong? You know, stuff like that. And again, I don't know what I'm going to do. I'll probably just do it right now. But the reason I'm telling you is, um, again, I'm trying to give back to the people that have been donating on Patreon and also extend an offer if anybody would like to get involved. The plan is going to be um, anybody that is $10 and above uh, will have access to these. And is that what it was? I don't know. But also there's a opportunity for those who are, whatever my highest tier is, those guys will be doing it live. And, you know, hope, I haven't done any live thing. I know there's an opportunity and a way to do live streaming on Patreon. But what I'm hoping to do, if it's possible, is to kind of watch it live with you guys, have the comment section go on, maybe, you know, hey, go back and look at this, whatever. Just kind of do it that way. That's the plan right now. We'll see how this goes. But uh, keep an eye on that. If there's any invites that go out, I don't know if you're going to listen to this by the time um, I actually get started. But I'm going to try to invite you guys to come watch with me if I can do it live. But that's just a heads up. Otherwise, like I said, um, tomorrow, I think maybe we'll just start diving into some of the questions. So if you have any questions or comments for the game, get it into the Facebook group or the uh, check the description. There is a phone number there. You can text or call with any questions, comments, concerns. I think that's it. I think that's all I got. I don't know. If I think of something else, I'll let you know in the Facebook group. Be sure to get into the Facebook group. You folks have yourselves a fantastic Friday. I will talk to you tomorrow. Have a good one. Bye-bye.